So um, it's kind of important when you're doing PSI to take care of yourself. You can work yourself to, uh, into a corner and um, it's going to happen. And uh, it's good to take breaks and do other things, you know, not take academics so seriously all the time. And uh, so in that spirit, I invite you to come and join me today at 3 p.m. to go to the Kitchener Blues Fest. So what, you know, if you want to come, what you'll do is that we'll meet downstairs at 3 p.m. and walk to the bus station. If you have your water cart, you know, it'll be free. Otherwise, I think it's 3.50 each way or something. It won't break the bank. And, you know, the Blues Fest is, is free. And it goes over... You know, you know, it goes on through the weekend. So if you don't want to go today, you can go tomorrow. Um, so, you know, just, um, and, you know, in the meantime, you can even look up what's, uh, you know, what's on offer and, you know, if you want to go to a different time. So, you know, there's lots of interesting things, especially in Kitchener. I don't know why that happens. Uh, it's just a city next door. It's actually the same city. It's just like, you know, they're joined together. So I, en I encourage you to do that. Next week, you know, um, after the lectures, I'll go in the evening climbing, and Lauren will go with me. And those of you who want to try it out for the first time or, or just, like, continue climbing, you guys can come with us. I'll give the details more later, okay? Awesome. Uh, so uh, I looked up this uh, reducibility business yesterday, and... Uh, This is uh, apparently, so a representation is reducible if it can be written in this form. If it can be written in an upper triangular form. So if D acts on the vector space V, then there is a subspace, invariant subspace W, that this form preserves. But the orthogonal complement of that space is not invariant. So this is an example of what is known as reducible. And fully reducible, will have the form where there it, uh, the, you can actually bring the representation to a block diagonal form. <clears throat> so let me give you a very quick, OK, before I go on to give you a quick overview of how Lie algebras arise from Lie groups. Are there any questions? Yes. And what about the word decomposable? Um, I'm not sure what that is. I think probably the, the, the fully reducible is probably, I don't know. Yeah. Is there any conditions on D1 and D2? Do they have to be faithful, not faithful? It doesn't matter. Um, right. I mean, I think they're. Uh, I don't think there is. Yeah. For irreducible, they have to be a non trivial representation. It doesn't even say if it has to be faithful. Uh, they just have to be like not the trivial representation. Yeah. For the fully reducible, would D1 and D2 have to be um, irreducible representations? If not, you could have a reducible representation. And then it would be fully reducible. Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry. Would D1 and D2, if the fully reducible one, have to be irreducible representations? Uh, yeah, because otherwise you could actually otherwise, do it further, right? Yeah. And, uh, but it could be. It could be more than two, right? Uh, right, yeah. It could be more than two. Yeah. Anything else? All right. So, uh, 
<coughs> let's uh, get on with it. So, you know, given a manifold, say M, this is some manifold. <clears throat> there is really no um, natural way to define a vector, uh, you know, a vector field on it. In physics, we define it by setting some physical, uh, you know, fields on it or matter, you know. So an example of a vector field is, say, fluids through some pipe or something, right? At every point in that manifold, you have the you know, velocity of the fluid. But if I just give you a manifold, there is really no natural notion of a vector field, you know. However, on Lie manifolds, or Lie groups, <coughs> of, say, dimension n, you know, one can define, like, naturally define n vector fields. So, if you don't know what a vector field is, it's basically some, you know, every point you have some small vector which is smoothly varying. That's the heuristic. So in some sense, you know, every point you have a tangent space and you're specifying a vector on the tangent space with which varies smoothly as you go from point to point. <clears throat> so we will see that, uh, so how do we define this? So let's look at the tangent space at the identity element. So, so the tangent space at the identity element <coughs> so analogous to the tangent vector that we defined at the identity element you can define a tangent vector in the following way so I take one of these group elements and then take the derivative with respect to the parameter and then set the parameter to zero. And so there is no sum over A in this formula. So this gives me a set of n vectors at the identity. So I can think of these guys as tangent vectors at the, ta at the tangent spa space at the identity. Now, I claim that there are n <coughs> vector fields on the manifold. All I've shown is that there are n vectors, tangent vectors at the origin. So how does one extend these vectors to the whole manifold? Any guesses? Lead derivative? Exactly, lead derivative, right? So the lead derivative <coughs> will come to that notion but I'm actually going to give you a, bet, a, a different answer, and uh, I'll claim I'll make that claim without proof. But I think it's right. I just didn't get the time to prove it. <coughs> so, so suppose, given one of the tangent vectors of the identity, you want to naturally obtain a tangent tangent vector, say at the group element G. 
then what you do is that you take this guy. So this group element, say, is given at, uh, so this is a, I believe that this is what you should get when you actually get like integrate the lead derivative, which I have not introduced. So this will take you. <coughs> so uh, the underlying idea behind it is that if you have two manifolds, say M and N, and there's a map between these two manifolds. <coughs> so which means that just any point here is mapped to some other point here. Let's call that map, say, uh, psi. Then that map induces a map from the tangent space or the space of tangent spaces, which is known as a tangent bundle, of M to the tangent bundle of N. So this map induces what is known as a push forward map. And this basically takes you from the tangent bundle of M to the tangent bundle of N. So, and these two manifolds, M and N, can be the same manifold. And in our case, that is, the, that is exactly the case. If we have, like, we, we take an element, say the identity element, and we multiply it from the left by some other element, then we get this. So, so you know, so left multiplication, is a map from M to M, okay? So the map, so the, the, the map that it induces on the tangent space is this one. Um, that's my claim. Is it a claim or it's just a definition that defining a map well, so you know, I so okay. This is how I think. You may not agree with it. Uh, it's. I mean, it's clear that if this is a Lie algebra, then this is going to be a Lie algebra. Okay. And uh, so I don't see any other possibility. But as I said, I haven't been. I haven't actually worked this out. The best way to do this to actually take the lead derivative, integrate it, and find the integral. You know, the solution to it. Right. But so I, I I'm I'm making this claim, but you know, see if you can verify it. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Algebra. That's a good question. And algebra is okay. Uh, vector space where we define multiplication of vectors. Okay. Right. So um, yeah. So in this case. Uh, we will get to it, but you know the, for example, these matrices. They form a vector space if you, say, add to it the zero element, right? The null element. That much is clear, right? So then it's just a vector space. But on a vector, but these are also matrices, so square matrices. So we can multiply them together to get another square matrix. So. <laughs> so, the, so that so the, not only is this a vector space, there is the multiplication, uh, a notion of multiplication, uh, uh, defined, which maps you from the same two elements of the same space to the same two elements of the one element of the same space, right? So, yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, so 
at the origin, we have three linearly independent tangent vectors. So if I take one of them and just, you know, this is actually what is known as a joint action, which we will get to next. If you apply this action on those guys for all the Gs here, so these are Gs, right? If I do this for all the Gs, then for the given tangent vector, I get a tangent vector, a, spe a specified tangent vector at every point on this manifold. And if I do it n times for the n different tangent vector of the origin, I get n vector fields on my manifold. So, in other words, <coughs> for sigma a by two or a one, two, three, we get um, we basically, this gives you the vector field for all G in big G. Okay, so, so the, the Lee, uh, Lee derivative, uh, the name of Lee derivative just came up. What is a Lee derivative? I'm actually not going to uh, define rigorously what a Lee derivative is. That you will see that in the gravitational physics course in January unless you want to look this up. It's not a very hard, or you can talk to me later. <coughs> um, so as you know that on a curved manifold, if you have two vectors at two points, there is no natural way of comparing them. However, if there is a vector field defined on a manifold, then we can use that, that vector field to actually kind of drag the vector at one point to have the vector at another point, and I, we can compare them. Okay. <clears throat> so this is, uh, what Lee found is that this way of taking the derivative of y with respect to x can be expressed as a commutator of two vectors. <clears throat> so, you know, a, a, a tangent vector is some, is kind of a, a derivative operator. And uh, so if you were to apply two derivative operator on a function, it would not give you another tangent vector. But it turns out, the commutator of two of these vector field is a sorry this should be a, is a vector so that's something that Lee discovered okay. <clears throat> so if we take these guys to be Our, our tangent vectors, it turns out that this is going to be, this must be another tangent vector because it's in the ta same tangent space. So it must be some linear combination and we choose those linear combinations coefficients in such a way that they're real and we will make choices 
This is the physicist's definition. We make choices for these tangent vectors in such a way that there's an i here. Mathematicians choose them in such a way that there is no i there. So, you know, this i kind of things come from the fact that we are thinking of matrices, and these are Hermitian matrices, and these are real numbers, and things like that. But, you know, if, if the commutator of two vectors should be a vector in that, that space, it should be a linear combination. And that's what this equation is telling me. So there is a sum over C. So for the case that we are interested in, it'll turn out that this thing is a completely anti-symmetric Levi-Civita symbol, but in general it's not. <coughs> so this is called the Lie algebra. And uh, The f coefficients are called structure constants. And note that the way it is defined, the structure constants are antisymmetric in the first two indices. The kind of Lie groups that we'll be interested in mostly, <coughs> we will sh show that the structure constants for those guys can be chosen to be completely antisymmetric. We'll show that later today. So, what does this uh, Lie algebra actually mean? So, what it means is that. So near, so near the origin, you have these vectors, tangent vectors. <coughs> pointing in different directions. Now you can use the exponential map, and you will get some, you know, as you ramp up the, the parameters in the exponential map, you will, you will get some curve along which, you know, it moves you. It's the, you know, it's the curve along which you have the one parameter abelian, uh, you know, subgroup. And say after a parameter distance of s, you reach this point. So this is your sigma one of two, you know, in this point at at, at this parameter distance s, and uh, Great. So over here you will have another sigma two. So if you were then to go this way, which is along the, you know, <coughs> these are called integral curves of sigma two, a distance t away, and here you will find some. And if you go again in this way, s, and you end up here, and if you, if you go this way along t, end up here, it turns out that these, and you know, in general, this rectangle will not close. And the Lie derivative measures the failure of this rectangle to close. And you can think of it as a infinitesimal <coughs> measure of non-commutativity. Non That's a hard word to say. So that's my spiel about how Lie algebras arise from Lie <coughs> derivative. Note that there is nothing special about the identity element, at least not for the finite dimensional Lie algebras or Lie groups we are looking at. You know, the, the, the tangent vectors that we defined at some other parameter position, phi, if you, it's easy to compute that they satisfy 
the same Lie algebra. Because these are G and G inverses, they will cancel and, okay, that this reduces to this, and vice versa. Okay, what are the properties of the lead derivative? Because we are, when these are matrices, they actually become just uh, commutators. So uh, a non-committal and politically correct name for these guys is the Lie bracket. If you get a bracket named after you, it means you've arrived in mathematics. There's the Lie bracket, there's the Poisson bracket, and there's the Dirac bracket. Dirac actually has more than one bracket. The bra cat rotation, of course, which is uh, very clever, but in mathematics, in, in uh, geometry, there's a different Dirac bracket. <clears throat> All right, so, so on a typical, say, Lie algebra, We get something like T A T B I of F A B C T of C. So these T A's are called generators because they generate the group through the exponential map. So as I've already mentioned, the F, A, B, C, they're known as the structure constants. Rarely do you actually have to know the structure constants themselves. So on compact Lie groups, These are completely antisymmetric. The Lie bracket itself is antisymmetric. And the way we have defined the Lie bracket, which is the commutator, it satisfied what is known as the Jacobi, or if you're an English speaker, Jacobi identity. This is just a cyclic permutation. There are a lot of identities named after Jacobi or Jacobi, including one in string theory, which is uh, important for the supersymmetry super symmetry of the string theory. Um, so now what we can do is that we can take this x, y, and z to be to be you know uh, the generators and use this in the Jacobi identity, so this is, then we get a relationship in, for the structure constants. Sorry, I should, for now I should write it like that. <coughs> so the relationship that you get is, uh, It's, it's careful not to make a mistake here if you're going to use this formula later on, which I will do. But you will make a mistake if you are rushing through things.
So this is what the Jacobi identity implies. <coughs> so an important comment is that notions of reducibility <coughs> of groups transfer over to the algebra so for example If these guys, sorry, act on some two-dimensional, you know, uh, vector, then this acts. This can act on the same, you know, vector space. They are just some kind of, they are just like, you know, re, the, they are just uh, related to the identity element. They're basically, you know, these guys around the identity element is just, for, infinit for infinitesimal, is just this thing. So it's kind of obvious, but it's, <clears throat> as matrices, they have the same dimensionality. So they can act on the same vector space. So in literature, especially in mathematics, if you have a Lie group, Sorry. yeah. Uh, what were you saying here about with the exp okay, sure. exponential? Why, why is this related to reducibility? Okay, let me explain. Yeah. So I mean, it's a, it's. A, so, you know, the exponential of i of theta dot sigma by 2, in our case, it's a 2 by 2 matrix, right? Mm -hmm. So, it acts on some two-dimensional co column vector, right? So, what I'm saying is that the Lie algebra elements, which have this form, they're also 2 by 2 matrix matrices, right? So they can also act on the same vector space. Okay, okay so. Uh, when was it? One is if it's invariant for the group, it's going to be invariant for the algebra as well. But yeah. You can expand it like that. So <clears throat> an important comment is that so given a Lie group, You can always derive the Lie algebra. But if you're given the Lie algebra, the other way is not always unique. Getting to Lie group, and explicitly we will see this in the case of the SU2 Lie algebra. So the Lie algebra, let me write the Lie algebra of SE2 like this. This will <coughs> take us to, when we exponentiate it, we will <coughs> see that we arrive at two different groups. One is called SU2. The other one is called SO3. So they locally look the same, but globally, they're not the same. And SU2 is said to be the cover of SO, SO3. It's a, a double cover. We, I mean, we'll actually do this in, in painful detail, perhaps in Monday's tutorial. Yes? Yeah. 
the structure constants? Uh, yes, exactly. Yes. They, I mean, <coughs> this is a particular representation of the Lie algebra in terms of two by two matrices. That is not, but the Lie algebra is more abstract. So if I give you, uh, if you, of course, exponentiate, we will see that SO3 uh, matrix, the fundamental representation of SO3 are three by three matrices. So there is no way that you'd be getting a three by three matrix from exponentiating these matrices. <coughs> so an extremely important concept in the, in the algebra is the idea of the adjoint representation. But before go to be, go to the adjoint representation, let me define what the adjoint action is. So this is the joint action. <coughs> it's just, uh, you know, conjugation. Now I'm going to make a claim. And the claim is the joint action on the Lie algebra of G by the group G form an irreducible representation of the Lie algebra acting on itself. Kind of a very cryptic statement. We will unpack it now. Okay, what does this mean? <coughs> this defines something called an adjoint representation. So let me prove this fact. So we, let's take, let's define these two, sorry, this G inverse to be T tilde of A. Then of course, you can verify that this satisfies the same Lie algebra. <coughs> so that means that <coughs> we should be able to expand this object as a linear combination of the original Lie algebra elements. Oops, sorry, there should be B there. Because if TA is in, Lie, in the, is in the Lie algebra, so is TA tilde. That's what this statement is saying. <clears throat> now let's take an infinitesimal element. say, um, G, then it's some identity plus I. <clears throat> now since as theta goes to zero, you now we must have TA is equal to TA tilde. TA tilde is equal to TA. 
it must be that CAB should also have an analogous expansion. So it's the identity plus something that depends linearly on the same parameter. Some object which looks like this. Right? Yes. Sorry, I just don't really understand how you can compute g t a g minus one since g is in the Lie group and t a is in the Lie algebra. Right, they have the same dimension, so they're compatible as matrices. <clears throat> I mean, they're not the same objects. No, they're not the same objects, like ab ab in abstract sense, but. Just if you think of them as matrices, you know, they're compatible matrices. How can G be a matrix? Uh, so G we actually get by exponentiating the Lie algebra elements. So they must have the same uh, dimensionality. So um, before we start, um, I'm, I'm not really sure how this was organized, you know, the physics in nature groups, but our friend Arthur just arrived yesterday. This, welcome, Arthur. And he is without a group. No pun intended there. We had another arrival though yesterday. Okay, so. I don't know. Okay, you guys maybe can form your, like, uh, reduce, uh, like a smaller group than the others, or is the, or you can attach yourself to two different groups. Um, I guess I, I I don't know what uh, would be a time because actually it's on Monday, so I don't know if they want to come like so more than that. Yeah, I mean I think that's so because they've been thinking about projects for since Tuesday night, so it's better if you guys like go and attach yourselves to some groups. Yeah, like you know they're, they're nice people, so you know just okay. I just uh, oh, remind your name again. Hi. Your name? Haido. Haido? Yeah. Haido. Yeah, and welcome to Haido. Okay. Can I also be one other person uh, in may show up before Monday as well? Sorry? There's a, at least one more person who may show up before Monday as well. Okay, well, the more the merrier, right? Um, yeah, this is like really a, a, a team building exercise. There's nothing to stress out about. The idea is to have fun. Actually, that's the idea is it's, we f forget that physics is supposed to be we do this weird thing called physics that no one else does in the world. And you know, we do it because we love it, and then we stress out over it. No. Anyway, so uh, it should be clear why this should have the same in infinitesimal form, right? <clears throat> so now if I expand both sides of this. The left-hand side gives me the leading term is TA, and then the subleading term is I, say theta, uh, C, I think I made a mistake in my notes. Um, one plus G, yeah, I sure did. Okay, so this should be then T of C, the commutator of T of C and T of A. On the right-hand side, we get uh, delta AB acting on, uh, Sorry, delta A. TA? Sorry? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, well, acting on TB, right? And uh, then we have I of theta of C acting, and then we have A of B, C, and uh, it should be TB. So these guys cancel, and these are arbitrary numbers. So we are left with T 
A T B is equal to minus F A B C T of C. Sorry, no T of C, T of B. Uh, no, oh God, sorry. I meant C here. And I meant B here. Okay. So I, yeah? Uh, on the first line on the right there, so on the right hand side, that's just C A B T B, right? And then right. On the left hand side, are you expanding G T A G? And yeah, I'm expanding that and keeping the the term up to order theta. Okay, yeah. So is the capital F structure constant or is it something else? It is something else. These are the coefficients. This is defined by this equation. Okay. So C's are the, uh, are the linear, uh, you know, coefficients of the linear combination. But because, you know, in the limit where the thetas goes to zero, these two guys should be the same. That means that in that limit, the C should become the identity matrix, which is this thing. So to order lambda, you know, this is some theta C times something. I have, uh, sorry, this shouldn't be something, right? Uh, you had a question? Okay, okay thank you. Great. Okay. So now, what I'm going to, I'm claiming that f of c, a, b, I'm going to define the matrix f of c, whose matrix elements are a, b, and that matrix element is given by minus f, a, b, c. This is my definition. So let's pause. What is the dimensionality of this matrix if my Lie algebra is n-dimensional? N by n. How many matrices are there? N, right? So it is possible that this matrices, Fc, form an n-dimensional representation of the Lie algebra. And that's something that we will verify, whether or that's not true. It is unusual because if you think of um, the rotation all of the two-dimensional, uh, you know, <coughs> wave function that we uh, discussed here, that was a three-dimensional, a three-dimensional Lie algebra because there are three generators there, but the matrices there are, are two by two. So, so here we, we, we have the possibility how, of having a representation whose dimensionality as matrices are the same as the dimensionality of the Lie algebra. That's possible. It forms a useful representation because if you have SO2, then you're going to have a two-dimensional representation. It's yeah. Abelian, so it could be. Yeah, it, 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 you can show that this is an uh, irreducible representation. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is something that, you know, we'll see that. I won't prove that fact, but for example, uh, we'll see that the SO3 matrix, the SO3 group is actually the adjoint representation of SU2. And in SO2, you have a two-dimensional In SU2? SO2. Yeah, but the SO2 is E1. Yeah, but so you'd have a two-dimensional representation of SO2 from this construction you've created. Uh, oh, okay. I, this is actually only valid for non-abelian Lie algebras. So where that would be an abelian case, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so... Right. So the, I uh, made an error somewhere in a minus sign, so something might mess up, but I think it should be okay. So <clears throat> what, you know, what do these matrices have to be if this claim is true? Let's see if... Uh...
So if I say the structure constants F A C B, if we define these to be this thing, I'm claiming that <coughs> this is going to give you what we need. So, uh, okay. So, in other words, so I'm using the fact that the Structure constant is anti-symmetric in the first two indices here. And uh, this is my definition of these matrices. I've rewritten them so that the order in which these indices appear here are, is also the order in which the, these indices appear here. It's easier to memorize. <clears throat> so now what we need to do is to compute what these things are. Now, <clears throat> because we have them in terms of matrix elements, we need to take the matrix element of compute this. Now, um, do you guys want me to do this? We, we do, okay. So what is this thing? This is, <coughs> F of C acting on F of D minus F of D F of C, right? This is what this means. This matrix act acting on this matrix minus this matrix acting on this matrix. And we are taking the AB element of this. <clears throat> Sum over repeated indices implied. Okay. So now we use a definition. So there are two minus signs coming from these guys, then two i's. So there's an overall minus sign. So minus CAE DEB plus. Uh, because there's a minus sign here already, F of DAE, F of CEB. So now what I've done is that I will write this, I will, I will uh, change some of the indices so that it has the same form as the Jacobi identity I wrote earlier. So we have C A E F of D E B. The first remains the same, but this sign is now changed. And then this becomes F A D E. So I have switched these two guys, and that picks up a minus sign. But this I keep the same. Now, if you go back to the Jacobi identity I wrote and painfully map the free indices here to the free indices there. And uh, you will find that you get F of D, C, E, F of A, E, B. <coughs> and uh, which we can say that we can then switch these two indices. And then we pick up a minus sign, but that minus sign can be absorbed into I squared by writing it as I squared. So we have C, D, E, A, E, B. And uh, then we use this definition on this guy, the second guy. So we have one I left over and this left over C, D, E. And we have minus i. The minus comes from the fact that we are now going to switch this to e of a. And this remains the same. So we have i of fcd of e. 
and this is if E A B. <clears throat> right. So this is so we have shown that <clears throat> the <clears throat> adjoint action gives rise to a representation which is the a joint representation. So this is the joint representation. If I suppress the matrix indices, this is my adjoint representation. <coughs> and uh, the set forms an n by n dimensional by here I mean matrix dimensions E rep of the Lie algebra where the dimension of the Lie algebra is n. <clears throat> So the joint representation is very useful. It allows us to define an inner product on the space of Lie algebras. So for example, suppose we have an element T, A, and an element T, B. We can define some inner product as the trace of the adjoint representation of the corresponding matrices. Now, this is a real symmetric matrix. Why is it real? Remember how F is defined. Right? F is defined in terms of the structure constants. There's an I there. The structure constants are real. There are two I's in this trace, so therefore, it's real. We didn't necessarily define the structure constants to be real, did we? Uh, yes, we, we did. We can, yeah, we did. Uh, um, so this is real and symmetric. Symmetric in A and B. Why is it symmetric? It's a trace. It's a trace, right. So that means that we can actually bring it to some diagonal form where k, a are the eigenvalues. So there's no sum here. And it turns out something I'm not going to show. In fact, I don't even know how to show it because I haven't looked it up, is that if G is compact, <coughs> then
Okay, sorry. Before I go there, um, you can actually rescale the Fs. You can actually rescale the Fs so that the modulus of these eigenvalues are 1. However, the sign cannot be adjusted, cannot be changed by, res by rescaling. So the number of different signs are invariant. And <clears throat> so for compact D groups, so by compact I mean that in some sense the volume of the manifold that describes the Lie Li group has has finite volume. <clears throat> so, you know, it's not, yeah. We will see Lie groups which are not compact. The Lorentz group, which you, you know, you can just keep on boosting, right? And it's actually a non-compact. Uh, <clears throat> so for compact Lie groups, you can choose these to be some, pos some positive constant. So where lambda is zero. And then the trace of F A and F B becomes this. When you can do that, you can choose, you can show that the structure constants are actually completely anti-symmetric. So this implies that structure constants are completely anti-symmetric. So, uh, so let's just introduce the notation where we say F A B C, we write it as F of A B D, just to make our life easier. We are not saying that B and C is anti-symmetric, but we are just rewriting rewrite, re it so that they are on the same level. Okay. So, so, yeah? So bad. Yeah. Yeah. What? What gradient goes into showing that this representation is very useful? You know? Because we explicitly build the representation, but what guarantees that? Right, what guarantees that it's irreducible? Uh, well, I mean, I guess you'll have to show that you cannot actually, uh, there is no similarity transformation that brings it into diagonal form. And if it's a, if it's a simple Lie algebra, uh, so, for, uh, yeah? so it's not, so the way you define the adjoint is big A adjoint. But little a adjoint is always an irrep if it's if it's a symbol, if it's simple. But right. A adjoint is not necessary. And uh, that's what we were saying with SO two, and even like if you consider E eight, the smallest non-trivial Lie algebra representation is two forty eight. Right. That's the smallest irrep, and that's not dimension eight. That's on what? That's that's not. That doesn't seem like that's proper. E eight has. It's a, it's rank eight. Rank eight. Yeah. yeah. But it is, uh, what is it, 248 dimensional? Is it? Yes. Yeah, it is, it is uh, SU2 is, has rank one, but E8 is 248. Let me come back to your question. I'll, I'll think about it. I'm sure there's a simple answer. I mean, I've never actually done, you know, prove this, but, you know, um, I'll just try this weekend and let you know. Okay.
And if you figure it out, let me know. Okay. Unless someone has the answer. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this question. Thank you. I have another question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why, why does this imply that the structure constants are completely anti-symmetric? No, but I'm going to prove it now. Oh, right. right. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with, say, working out the trace of the commutator of this times Fc. Now, if I use the Lie algebra in the first term, I get trace of I of A, B, D, F of C, sorry, F of D, F of C. <clears throat> So on the left-hand side, we have trace of F A, F B, F C minus trace of F C, F A, F B. OK, on the right-hand side, we can write this as uh, I, F A, B, D. These are just numbers, so we can pull them out of the trace. And then what we have is the trace of F D F C, which we write as lambda of delta D C. On the left-hand side, what we can do is that we can uh, use the cyclicity of the trace to write the first term. So here we had a commutator between A and B. Now we'll try to get a commutator between B and C. So first term, we can write this as F of B f of c, f of a, minus f of c, uh, the second term, I, uh, you guys are not paying attention, right? This should have been f, b, f, a, f, c, right? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> this I can uh, do the cyclic, then this becomes this thing. On the right-hand side, we have I lambda F of A, B. Summing over D gives me C here. <clears throat> In the left-hand side, I have trace of the commutator of F, B and F, C multiplied by F, A on the right. This guy remains the same. And uh, <clears throat> this thing is I times F B of C D. Then we have trace of F D F A. And we have I lambda F A B C. I'm going to use horrible blackboard practices and right here. So uh, this thing is lambda delta D A delta A B. D A, so but there's a sum over D, so I can replace that sum, uh, the D by A. So we have, and the lambdas and the i's on both sides cancel out. So we have in the end F B C A is F A B C. Right. Now, the left hand side. We can use the fact that uh, these two guys are antisymmetric to write this as minus F C B A. The right hand side, using the fact that these two guys are antisymmetric to write this as F B minus F B A of C. Oh, uh, hang on. Uh, F. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I didn't have to change that actually. Yeah, sorry. So I could have just like, okay, the left hand side I don't need to change. So, what we have seen is that the 
structure constants are anti-symmetric in the last two indices. Okay? That's what we have shown. And because it's anti-symmetric in the first two indices as well, it is anti-symmetric in all the indices, right? So the structure constants are anti-symmetric in all these indices. Or as completely anti-symmetric. Okay, so uh, may I take, uh, say, 10 more minutes that we lost, say, in the fire thingy? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, let's start with some examples of matrix groups. <clears throat> I will give you a small list of matrix Lie groups, and then hopefully next time we'll do in detail the properties of two of the most <coughs> often used matrix groups in physics. Okay? We will actually look at in them in gory detail. <coughs> Okay, so examples of matrix B e groups. I had not come across Lee's name until I was in my master's and it was during summer, between undergraduate and my master's in Bangladesh, we had a, a summer QFT class you know, taught by a professor who, it wasn't like a credit course, but we wanted, so he gave us a book and we were waiting for him, I remember. We had the chapter op open to lie groups. <laughs> so, <laughs> so perhaps the most, uh, like the, the master group, if you like, is the GL and K. So these are N by N matrices with entries in the field K, which in physics is usually R or C. Uh, and so the G and a very important restriction, the determinant of these matrices, let's call these matrices M, is not zero. Because if the determinant were zero, then there, you would not be able to define an inverse element. And this is a very, very general you know, group. Under multiplication, the G stands for general, L stands for linear. So this is the general linear group of N by N matrices. All the other Lie groups, matrix Lie groups, are subgroups of this guy. <clears throat> then there's the SLNK. Essentially, it's the same Everything else is the same, except instead of, deter of saying that the determinant is not zero, we say the determinant is one. <clears throat> the S-O-N groups 
So these are group of rotation in a of a of a rigid body in n dimension and these are spanned by these are some uh, matrices o and they are orthogonal meaning that the transpose of the matrix is the inverse and their determinant is 1. <clears throat> the S always tells you about the determinant. S meaning special. So these are special groups. And then there are the, the UN groups. And these are n by n unitary matrices. So meaning that <clears throat> entries are complex numbers. And the permission conjugate gives you the inverse. A subgroup of this is the SUN groups, when you impose the further condition that the, ident that the, the determinant is 1. So I'm not going to like tell you the, give you any list of, you know, what they're the generator should look like. We will actually do some of these ourselves. So let's try. Let's start today, and and in the next five minutes, I will uh, we will get get started on the special orthogonal group. Actually, um, Let's use this one. Saves a bit of time. So the special orthogonal group S O N. So suppose you have in N dimensions. some rigid object. Uh, I'm not going to draw an axis of rotation in n dimensions because it's only in three dimension. Rotation about an axis makes sense. In higher dimensions, you have to specify the plane that it's rotating in. Right? In three dimension, because of the Levi Civita, we have a you know, number of planes and number of axes are the same, right? Anyway, so so we have some rotation of some object. So let's do, let R be some vector, and the rotation of this object around some point in some plane means that if I if I rotate it by some n by n matrix. Its rigidity means that this, the length of this vector remains unchanged. Sorry. So what, when I'm writing R transpose R, I'm actually taking the, the <coughs> dot product. Okay, that's, so, so this means that O times R, and here this is O times R transpose. As you know, that the transpose means that we have to change the order of the matrices there. 
So this means we have we have to have this for the <coughs> length of this vector to remain unchanged. So in components, I can write this as ij ik delta jk. Now, <coughs> a real n by n matrix has n squared independent parameters, right? But because of this constraint, these parameters, not all these parameters are going to be independent. So how many independent parameters do we have due to this constraint? To answer this question, let's take a variation of this equation. So we are slowly changing the parameters infinitesimally. Then the left-hand side of this equation becomes OIJ OIK plus OIJ delta OIK. The right-hand side is zero. Now this is symmetric. in J and K. So there are two cases. <clears throat> when I set J equals to K, I get N constraints. When I said j is not equals to k, because of symmetry, I can take j greater than k without loss of. Then you can convince yourself that that implies n squared minus n by 2 constraints. Okay. This is a small, nice exercise for you to work out. So initially, I had n squared parameters. So if I subtract, this number, I get n, n minus 1 by 2. So this is the number of independent parameters. So that means that the dimension of S O n is n, n minus 1 by 2. So let's do some sanity checks. Yes? You've got n plus n squared take out two. So which one? It's going from the third bottom line there to the bottom line. Uh, so if I do this, OK, so then I have n squared minus n minus n, n minus 1. Oh, sorry. I... Right. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I do those mistakes all the time. No worries. All right, so let's do some sanity checks. The dimension of SO2, we know that we only need one angle in two dimensions to rotate. So, so here we have 2, 2 is, well. yes, we have 1, right? In three dimensions, you know that you have three independent angles, so you should get 3. So 3. Get three, right? <clears throat> Very nice. So, uh, what are the generators of this guy? So, um, we are not going to have I, although you can introduce I's here, but you know, it just messes things up a little bit. So, um, I'm going to parameterize this group. So let's take a infinitesimal parameter, then we would say, okay, it should have some form like this, where A goes from 1 to N, N minus 1 by 2, okay? So, and let's take these things to be real.
But I think if I were to, anyway. Uh, so and then we say, what does this imply for these TAs? Well, if you now expand this, then on the left, this one on both sides cancel out. And then to first order is you're going to have, should be an A, TA plus TA is zero. But these are arbitrary parameters, so it must be true that the generators are antisymmetric real matrices. There's a clever trick which makes uh, things look a little bit more it nicer. Transpose. Sorry? Shouldn't there be a transpose? Ha ha. It's antisymmetric. So there's a clever, clever scheme of, of labeling. Physicists and mathematicians are so scheming. So where we use two labels instead of one. But we say that they are antisymmetric in the labels. So, so if A and B go from 1 to n, n minus 1 by 2, the fact that it's antisymmetric shows that there are actually exactly the number of independent, linearly independent matrices here is the same as the number of linearly independent matrices here. <laughs> you know, namely, this number. So this is a label. These are not matrix elements. But we know that these are, as matrices, they are antisymmetric. So if I can say, if I take one of these matrix, and write out its CD element. It's going to look very CD. Sorry for that pun. Uh, <laughs> so now you actually have an explicit representation of the generators of the SO matrices. And this is going to be a finite element is going to be given by that. And then if you are nothing else to do, and you can verify that the Lie algebra satisfied this guy by these guys, is given by this wonderful formula. Which it is actually wonderful. People don't realize it. So this is the Now, the. Sorry, where did you get this from? The matrix elements of the generators. Uh, this one. So in your, if we if we define if we like label the matrices. Just from this condition. Sorry. Just from this condition that the transpose is minus t. Yeah, this and the way that we have labeled this, right? It's basically it's antisymmetric both in its labels and its matrix elements. So, this is not a Hermitian matrix. And because of that, we don't have eyes here. If we were to define our generators as being Hermitian, I mean, they're antisymmetric, right? Then, you know, we would have eyes, and, you know, it would look like the other structure constant. So, so you know, mathematicians, uh, you know, when they write down Lie algebras, they actually, the, 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 they actually don't use eyes, but, you know, then their, you know, operators are slightly different from the physics choices. It seems to me that, you know, anyway, they're both choices, but, you know, I chose not to use uh, 
permission uh, generators here. But you can. Okay, one last comment. Sorry, I'm keeping you here uh, for longer than I wanted to. Is uh, there is a relationship with ON groups. And uh, I just want to finish this so we don't have to come back to uh, this group in the next lecture. So if I start with this, you know, this uh, equation and take the determinant, then, you know, the determinant of a matrix doesn't change if it's transposed. So this gives me this. So, so this means that as far as this equation is concerned, I have two choices. However, this sort of parameterization forces one of the sign on us. So for example, if I take an infinitesimal element. So by dot, I mean this object is a um, shorthand. And let's just choose zeta in such a way that this thing is just n zeros everywhere. Then if I take the determinant of this, uh, right, the determinant is going to be so, the, 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 so this whole matrix is going to be something like this, right? So the determinant of this guy should give me uh, this thing, right? Do you agree? Uh, okay, I think there's a, so I wanted to argue that this shows that, okay, let me come, I think there's a logical flaw in this argument that I was going to present. Let me come back to that for the, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of next lecture, yeah, please? I just think there's a one half factor instead of Here? Uh, here? Or? So half of the matrix is a quarter. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. There's a one half factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That should be here? No, it should be, but then yes, later you didn't use it what you said when you wrote O. Oh, I see, right, right, right. It's even more than that. Okay, I see. So there should be. Should be half or yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then when right when you have this, then you should be on quarter, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was. I think there's some some uh, some slight. I'm having a little bit of a cognitive dissonance, as they say, because uh, my argument was that you know when psi goes to zero, this goes to plus one. But this is actually should be just one, so. And therefore, you know, the sign plus sign is chosen for us. Uh, but I think that's not the, not a rigorous argument as I'm thinking about it right now. So let me come back to that point. Um, I want to kind of argue that this parameterization, you know, tells us that three. Like the, the SON part contains the unity, so you can't expand that for the ones that had a determinant minus one, maybe. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, that's something. Uh, 
but you know what I have a little bit of a trouble with having a trouble with right now is that uh, you know the you know the determinant of O should be one, not one plus something. Yeah, yeah but that's you can just, just oh. yeah yeah I I see yeah okay right. You can derive that exponential at the parameter equals zero, then you get just and take the the, the determinant. Right, at the parameter of this, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then what if I change, if I increase the parameter from zero to, say, some small but non-zero value, I should still, that determinant should still be one. And uh, that's where, you know, so I, I actually am, yeah, I should have thought about it a little bit more carefully, but let me think about it and come back in the beginning of next lecture. I think uh, there's, uh, yeah. What were you trying to prove, actually? I was going to prove that, you know, this shows that we have to ch choose this to be uh, the determinant for if we, okay, so the idea is that if I chose this kind of parameterization, then I cannot choose the determinant of O to be minus one. Okay? Now, uh, so if I say, okay, this is actually true, you know, to leading order, then um, but you've neglected terms of order of second order anyway, right? In right, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it. So, because uh, we are, I, th I think, yeah. But let me just think about it a bit more carefully because, you know, what Leander is saying is that you know, in this expansion, we are ignoring, we are only taking terms up to fir first order, and that's. Thank you. That's exactly the argument. Is that we see that you know it's actually so. This is we can actually drop this, and then we see that having assumed this form, we get determinant O plus one, not minus one. That's it. Thank you. And that form comes from why did we assume that form? What what is the step? Uh, it's the kind of the there? you know we have the exponential map. All right. We are thinking of the exponential map there, and and that's kind of related to the fact that we are on a manifold, mm -hmm. and starting from some Lie algebra, we can go to some finite element, uh, so that's why. So uh, so you might wonder, what about the minus sign? They do play a role in physics. <clears throat> so for example, in three dimension, parity operator where you reflect through all the directions. That it does satisfy this as well, but the parity operator, you know, the determinant of parity is minus one. So in two dimensions, for example, the reflection operator is this, and that is also has determined minus one. And of course, uh, you can show that by rotating, you cannot get to these you know, uh, to these, uh, <coughs> configurations, and you actually have a, uh, they don't add to the dimension of the group, because there is no free parameter there, but they add to the volume of the group, and they add to disconnected components. So, you know, this is, say, for SON, this is the, component, you know, connected to identity, uh, but then there will be other stuff which are related by, uh, say, parity, but you can't, yeah, questions? So. Oh, I just wanted to check on that bottom board on the left, should A and B only run from one to N? Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? But the drawing, I mean, it is SON, the first one, and then the other one is... Right, so the, yeah, the first one is SON. This whole thing is cool. ON. Yeah. I'm, I'm just not really sure what you're trying to prove it. If you were trying to prove that you can only access matrices with determinant 1, 
you could just say that the determinant is a continuous function. Yeah, that's what so, I was saying. Oh. Yeah. You don't have the yeah. identity in that. Yeah. Maybe yeah. yeah. the determinant of the exponential is the exponential of the trace. Yeah, it's. Trace of t is zero. Right, right. Uh, Right, uh, so yeah, one could use that. And in fact, in SUN, I will use that. All right, thank you very much for listening and participating.